More than half of what we know about climate change comes from satellites orbiting far above our atmosphere. These Earth observation satellites measure everything from daily weather patterns to rising sea level over time and practically everything else in between. Every second of every day on every place on Earth. In this video, we're going to dive into just how important space technology is for helping us combat climate change, including how these satellites work, what data they're collecting, and what happens to the data, as well as some pretty wild historical context. Now, before we dive in, just a quick intro. I'm Camille, and I just spent the last five years working on cutting-edge space technologies, but I got fed up with how negatively the world views space, so earlier this year, I quit my job to change that through accessible and optimistic stories about how space technology is shaping the world that we live in and the future. To understand how we're collecting and using the data today, we need to go all the way back to the beginning of climate science. 200 years ago, in 1824, a French mathematician and physicist, Joseph Fourier, yes, the same guy who invented the Fourier transform and the law of heat conduction, hypothesized that Earth's atmosphere traps heat like an insulator, something we now call the greenhouse effect. In 1896, a Swedish scientist named Svante Arrhenius predicted that emissions from fossil fuel combustion would enhance this greenhouse effect. This hypothesis was proven in 1958 when an American scientist, Charles Keeling, collected the first evidence that fossil fuels were in fact altering our atmospheric CO2 levels. But we didn't know the full extent or even what we didn't know, because we didn't have a way to see the entire Earth at once and collect different measurements repeatedly that we could then average over time. But something was happening in a completely different arena that would soon change that. The space program. Remember, in 1958 is when we first realized that fossil fuels were a big problem. But just one year before that, in 1957, the world launched its first satellite, Sputnik. Now we had a way to see Earth from above. Then in the late 1960s, NASA launched both the first satellite that could measure Earth's temperature from above and the first people to the moon. The Nimbus 3 satellite completely revolutionized how we were able to study our climate, and photos of Earth from the Apollo program transformed the way we see our planet. So at nearly the exact same point in history, we got both the data and a dire call to action. Over the past 50 years, we've put hundreds and hundreds of satellites into space that just monitor Earth and help us understand our climate. We've gotten millions and millions of photos of our planet every single day since 1972, plus tons and tons of data. But there is a big problem with that data, which we'll get to in a second. We have a historical archive of Earth's land, oceans, atmosphere, and biomes dating back nearly six decades, thanks to satellites' unique ability to see our entire planet literally all the time. By tracking changes to these things over time, we've been able to get a really good understanding of our climate and how human activity is impacting it. And by analyzing trends, we've been able to create really complex high fidelity models of our climate that allow us to predict what it'll look like in the future and help policymakers and other global leaders make data-driven informed decisions about how to combat climate change in both the near and long term. But what data are these satellites actually collecting? As they circle the globe, highly advanced sensors on board detect signals across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. This allows us to see Earth in ways beyond what our own eyes can see. For example, thermal sensors picking up infrared light measure the temperature of Earth's surface and atmosphere. Radar instruments bouncing radio waves off of the ocean allow us to map sea ice and rising sea levels. Optical sensors like very high resolution cameras take photos of our land, showing how our land use is changing over time thanks to deforestation and urbanization. There are even things called hyperspectral imagers, which collect data across various parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is particularly useful for things like measuring the health and condition of crops. We also put satellites in different places around Earth depending on what we want to measure. For example, if you wanted to study Earth's surface in detail, such as changes in specific ecosystems, glacier movement, or urban development, you'd probably put your satellite into low Earth orbit. Being closer to Earth means two things. One, you get higher resolution imagery and data, but two, you can more easily deploy what's called a satellite constellation. And these are swarms of satellites that are in various orbits that are all doing the same thing. This allows you to revisit the same spot on Earth up to multiple times a day with a single swarm or a single constellation. Now, what if you wanted to constantly monitor something over a large area, say for things like weather forecasting? Well, you'd probably put your satellite into geostationary orbit. At this altitude, a satellite circles the Earth at Earth's rotational rate, 
allowing it to stay over the same geographic location at all times. No single satellite can cover the entire Earth or measure everything that we want to measure. So that's why we have a bunch of different satellites in a bunch of different orbits doing a bunch of different things in order to paint the clearest picture possible of our climate. And when that data is distributed to government organizations, companies, and researchers, global leaders can make much more informed and data-driven decisions about how best to combat climate change. For example, we can better predict and respond to natural disasters. In fact, there's a global organization dedicated to this called the International Charter Space and Major Disasters. Whenever a natural disaster strikes, any country free of charge can activate this charter, which sets off a chain of events where 270 satellites and the expertise of 17 space agencies from around the world are redirected to helping with that disaster and providing humanitarian relief to those in need. But there's still a lot of work to do when it comes to using all of the data at our disposal. Remember from the beginning I said that this data thing would come back? Well, listen to this. Some experts think that over 80% of all the data we collect about our planet goes unused. So one of the biggest gaps that we really need to address in the near term is better data fusion. Companies and global organizations, big and small, are working as we speak on improving the integration between space-based data and the data that's collected via airborne or ground-based systems. And they're developing better ways to quickly communicate the vast amount of climate change data to global leaders and policymakers because time is of the essence. A future that I'd really like to see, and I do think we can get there in the near term, is one where satellite data is processed with AI in the loop. And these systems would be capable of delivering information specifically to a customer with their specific needs in mind anywhere in the world in near real time. In the coming years, we're also going to see more technological advancements in the spacecraft themselves, allowing us to track things like methane from cow farts in a single pasture. Yes, this satellite did that for the first time in 2022. But no matter how important these satellites are, they can't exist without public support, and that's where you come in. Staying up to date, engaging with space content online like this, and even just telling your friends how cool and important space technology is goes a really long way. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I'll be back next week with the next episode of Space for Earth.